In this lesson, we'll do a quick run through of the Drake equation. But prior to handling the Drake equation, let's just do a, a review of where we've been. We have learned that our planet Earth, here's a picture from Cassini out at Saturn, turned back to image Earth. Our planet Earth is part of a solar system, and our solar system is one of many in the Milky Way galaxy. And our Milky Way has some near neighbors like the Magellanic Clouds. But even these three galaxies are just one among hundreds of billions in our entire universe. And we've learned a little bit about the history of this universe, beginning with the Big Bang and the formation of simple elements like hydrogen and helium, the formation of the first stars, and then next generation stars with uh, heavy elements being produced by supernova. As uh, more and more heavy elements are enriching these nebula clouds, now we can get new uh, stars with planets that are rocky planets. And on some of those rocky planets, if they're the right distance from the star, they might have liquid water. We're in interesting chemistry can occur, and we have the emergence of life on one of these rocky worlds, our own Earth. So the Drake equation is trying to figure out whether we're alone in our galaxy. Are there indeed other intelligent life forms in our galaxy? The Drake equation traces its history back to Frank Drake, who in the 60s was trying to raise money to build uh, radio telescopes to search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI, search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and to raise money for such a project. You, you sort of wanted to convince possible donors that, in fact, your project might succeed. So here we have the Drake equation then. He sort of tried to figure out how would you estimate how many communicating civilizations are in our galaxy. These terms here, all we would have to plug in values for these terms, and when we multiply them together, we get a number. And that number represents the number of communicating galaxies, or communicating civilizations in our galaxy. So are there three? Are there 30? Are there 300, 3,000, 3 million other intelligent civilizations with the technology to communicate with us? So n is a number. How many are out there? Let's begin then with the first term, r, r star. It's the rate of formation of stars. So when we look at a picture of our Milky Way here and all the little spots here, these are all stars. These are currently uh, active stars. These are stars that are doing their nuclear fusion in their cores. But there's a whole lot of gas and dust ready to make new stars and solar systems. So how often does that happen every year? Let's just do a, a quick recap of what a star is. So three things are needed to make a star. You've got to have hydrogen gas, gravity, and time. So over time, the gravity will compress this cloud of hydrogen gas, and so the temperatures will increase, and the pressure increases to such a point where the hydrogen nuclei, which are just protons, will start to fuse together. They will smash together with such energy to form helium nuclei, and energy is released. This is the fusion reaction. Now, the nucleus of a hydrogen atom is a positively charged proton, as you see on the left here. And to bring one positive charge next to another, they're going to experience a repulsive force. This is the electromagnetic force. But in the cores of stars, the gravitation is, uh, is crushing the cloud to such a degree, the temperatures and pressures are so high that it can overcome that electrical repulsion, and these two particles can fuse together. And it's a bit more complicated than that, but that's what fusion is, smashing together hydrogen nuclei to form a nucleus of the helium atom. So a star is a giant sphere of hydrogen gas held together by gravity, and then there's a counteracting force of nuclear fusion in the core of the star. So we can think when those two forces are sort of equally balanced, we have a stable star. Gravity will tend to compress the star. The energy released by nuclear fusion will tend to expand the star. And when those two forces are counterbalanced, we get a stable star. So the first term in the Drake equation is what's the rate of star formation per year? And astronomers have a pretty good handle on that value. The next term is what fraction of stars have planets? And here we've learned a little bit about NASA missions and the uh, launch launching of several uh, satellites, Kepler and TESS most recently, to look for exoplanets. And TESS specifically looks for the tiny drop in a star's luminosity as a planet might go in front of it. So when a planet is moving between the star and the cameras on the satellite, a little bit of that light is blocked by the planet temporarily. And TESS can uh, detect that change in light. 
Here we see this is our sun. And some months ago, uh, Mercury made a transit to cross the face of the sun. And so that little spot there is the planet Mercury, blocking a little of the sun's light. Now, the results of the Kepler and Tess missions have found thousands of planets around nearby stars. And just a reminder of how planets form, or at least rocky planets like our own, uh, rocky planets form from smaller particles of space dust. These are heavy elements and small little molecules and things that accumulate into larger particles and then into small rocks. And then gravity can kind of collect them all and smash them together to form larger and larger bodies until we get a spherical type of planet. In this picture, then, we see sort of the... Uh, the history of a solar system from a nebula that has hydrogen gas to make a star if it's enriched with heavy elements then the solar system can have a star with rocky planets as well and just to remind ourselves those heavy elements were produced inside stars and ejected in the form of supernova so it must be the prior generations of stars that go through their phases and exhaust their fuel and explode in tremendous explosions called supernova that's what is then seeding the nebula with these heavy elements like iron so one supernova is estimated to have 70,000 times as much iron as, as found in the core of the earth so when we look at nebula in the sky, then we want to think of these nebula as giant clouds of gas and dust. Uh, if, if we're talking about nowadays, these nebula are enriched with heavy elements due to previous generations of exploding stars. So this is all the stuff you need to make new solar systems with rocky planets. In fact, here we see the Orion Nebula here, and that little thing there is the horsehead nebula uh, using a wide angle lens but that horsehead is is thought to have about the material to make 30 new solar systems so we have found that most stars have planets because galaxies are old the universe is pretty old the universe has already gone through several generations of previous stars that have exploded to enrich nebula with uh, heavy elements so most stars in our galaxy are thought to have planets just a few years ago, this uh, set of radio telescopes in the high desert of the country of Chile uh, made one of the most important uh, discoveries, so the first image of a newly forming solar system. They were looking at a region of the sky, a star called HL Tauri. You can see on the left here, this is the region. It, is, it was a new star, and around that star, they detected a disk of material. And in fact, if we look more closely at the disk over here on the right, we see the central star, HL Tauri, and then there is this disk of material, but there are these gaps, these rings around the star. And scientists suspect that what's happening here is these gaps are places where newly forming planets are clearing their orbits. So we're visualizing the early stages of the formation of a new solar system. To give you a size comparison, the picture on the right here, this would be the size of our actual solar system relative to the HL Tauri system. HL Tauri is about three times bigger. So, but if we just think of this as sort of where we were five billion years ago, this is what our solar system would have been like five billion years ago when ours was forming. The next term then is what fraction of the planets uh, around stars are habitable? And we think of habitability as having liquid water on the surface. So in our system, we have Venus, Earth, and Mars, all three of which at one time had liquid water in the surface. For Venus, it got too hot, and the water evaporated to the atmosphere. Uh, Earth, we still, of course, have liquid water. Mars once had liquid water. There's evidence of that. But in time, its environment changed. It lost some atmosphere. It got cold. Now all the water is in the form of ice. But that's the habitable zone. And it is important to have liquid water. Here we see the Milky Way off the coast of California. Liquid water is really important on these planets, we think, because it is a wonderful place where chemistry, interesting chemistry can occur. Liquid is a fantastic solvent. So uh, with liquid on the surface, there are more op opportunities for interesting chemistry uh, 
The kind of chemistry on Earth that happened was the production of complicated mo molecules containing carbon atoms. Carbon atoms can make four chemical bonds, and so they can support a diverse range of complex molecules, from sugars to fat molecules and lipids to DNA and the building blocks of protein, all carbon-rich molecules. The next term in the Drake equation is the fraction of habitable planets where life emerges. On Earth, the story then, four and a half billion years ago, there was no life. Today, the planet is teeming with millions of species of living things. The key transition was the origin of a living cell, the simplest kind of cell we know of, bacteria. And NASA sort of defines life as a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. Well, a cell is the smallest unit of life on Earth. This was the smallest, simplest living thing that emerged from chemistry and then went on to evolve into millions of living species on Earth today. We'll call that the tree of life. Now here we'll take a closer look at the tree of life. At the root of the tree of life then is the origin of life. Here's the Drake equation on the left and that F term there, F sub I, or sorry, F sub L, would be the fraction of habitable worlds where life emerges. Well, that happened on Earth some 4 billion years ago. And the question is, was that a key event? Was that a rare event? Is this hard to do, or is life easy to do on these habitable worlds that might exist in our galaxy? And we'll see also in this course that uh, the transition from simple bacteria type cells to more complex cells, that raises another question of how easy is that to manage, or is that also a rare event, life getting more complex? So uh, looking at, in the bottom right here, looking at uh, our inner planets here in our system, we know there's life on Earth. Scientists are very interested in life, uh, whether life existed on Mars. Most recently, there has been some detection of some interesting gases in the atmosphere of Venus. It's po is it possible that life also emerged on Venus? Early in the solar system, it's thought that Venus had a more suitable uh, environment for life, kind of like Earth. So just those three planets in our system uh, are raising questions about how easy or hard it is for life to emerge in these habitable worlds. The next term in the Drake equation is the fraction of worlds where life does emerge. Does the life get intelligent? Of course, for us, we enjoy a super huge brain here, and so we can ponder uh, some of these deep questions. But not, not all living things uh, have big brains. In fact, lots and lots of animals have tiny brains. And of course, plants don't have brains at all. So if there is life on a planet, it, it is not just a foregone conclusion necessarily that life will evolve to be intelligent like we are. On our tree of life, we see again the origin of life at the bottom. And there's a critical transition where cells got more complicated here. That was really important because all of the intelligent life forms that we're aware of are composed of these um, complex cells. So again, we sort of want to ask the question, this transition from life to intelligent life, only a small fraction of animals on planet Earth are intelligent. Most living things on Earth don't have the kind of intelligence to ponder their own existence. Uh, so it does raise a question about how easy it is for life to get intelligent. Plants, for example, are doing quite well. They don't have the kind of intelligence that we're talking about. Animals, of course, uh, can have big brains, but by far majority, the majority of animals do not have the big brains. So is intelligence a rare phenomenon? But it did happen on Earth, and of course we went ahead to use our intelligence to build instruments to study our universe and to build machines to take us to faraway places. In fact, this is the Voyager spacecraft that is now leaving our solar system. It was launched in the 70s to study the outer planets. It is now leaving, and prior to leaving, Carl Sagan uh, asked the, uh, the team to turn the camera back around to take a picture of our Earth. And our Earth is somewhere here in this picture. Can you find it? There it is. That's our home. And when you look at a picture like this, we, we do it just it, it, we do seem like we're living on some tiny little speck in a much vaster universe. 
The next term in the Drake equation is the uh, fraction of intelligent uh, uh, life forms that will start to develop technology and have the technology to communicate. Now, for 80 or so years, we have been transmitting radio signals. We, of course, use the radio for our own purposes, but it also has been uh, radiated out into space at the speed of light for about 80 years. We have also built machines to detect radio uh, signals. Uh, turns out that lots of things in the universe, not living things, but lots of other things, you know, uh, stars and planets and things, emit radio waves that can be detected by these giant receivers. They're, we can think of them as radio telescopes. And in fact, that array of radio telescopes in Chile was the one that they were the ones that detected uh, the first solar system ever pictured by humans. And they've also uh, were instrumental in detecting that um, that gas on in the atmosphere of Venus that that is a, poten a potential biosignature for life on Venus that remains to be seen. The last term then is the L term. How long will a civilization that can communicate, how long will it typically list, uh, last? How long or what's the duration of a technological civilization? Of course, on Earth, there are many people who are concerned about our technology. Some of the technology uh, is very powerful indeed, and it may uh, end up uh, causing problems on Earth. So humans have harnessed the power of the atom, just as uh, our nearby sun does. Humans can recreate that fusion process to make dangerous weapons. Here we see a picture from the space station of the surface at night and notice all the lights here in the cities. Well, of course, we generate electricity to run our lights, but uh, for a long time that electricity was produced by burning fossil fuels. These are fuels like coal and, and oil and natural gas that have uh, ad uh, carbons, carbon atoms in them. And when you burn anything with carbon in it, you make carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide goes up into the atmosphere. It traps heat, so it's a greenhouse gas, and that can potentially be threatening uh, our civilization. One way around that would be to colonize some other world, like Mars, for example. We've sent machines there. It's only a matter of time till we send people, people there. And perhaps in 100 years, we'll have colonies on Mars. Maybe that will give us some insurance in case the Earth has some devastating catastrophe that our civilization can continue. But that L term is a big unknown. How long can a technological civilization last? So we have an un an unanswered question. Are we alone? Is there anybody else out there? And the Drake equation just helps us get a sense of what kinds of things do we need to consider to make an estimate for how many communicating civilizations are out there. Now, the Drake equation originally was applied to our Milky Way galaxy, but in principle, we can think about it as applying to any galaxy in our universe.